Radio check. Loud and clear. KSL Sports and KSL Podcast present Mode Push, an American view of F1, starting now. Don't stop. He's what you get. Look his f- Honestly. I've guessed it. I've absolutely guessed it. I enjoy this so f- much. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome on in. It's another edition of Mode Push, an American view on F1. It's our podcast where this is our baby. This is just us talking about some F1 from the American perspective right here in the good old USA. Dan Jimenez, my co-host as usual. I'm Alex Keery. Thanks for being with us. Dan, what's up, man? I mean, you and I both had very busy weeks last week. We haven't been able to do the full breakdown of Spain, but we're back to racing after a week off. And here we are, first of all. How did you love Spain? How much did you love what happened in uh, in Barcelona, man? Uh, it was a better race than I was expecting it to be, even though Max won. He, I think he had to try harder. I, f- I got the sense Red Bull was having to watch Mercedes, and Mercedes kind of came out and surprised everybody. So I thought it was a good race. I, 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 I enjoyed it. Mercedes did shock a lot of people, maybe themselves, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, in the yeah. process. And then there's a lot of jockeying of, like, at the end of it, of what exactly does that mean Spain is supposed to give you a little bit of a better snapshot for the rest of the year, you know, supposedly. I don't know how much that actually is true now, considering that the all the upgrades that everybody's bringing at different races at different times. This was the upgrade, I think, that a lot of people were waiting to see what was going to happen. Uh, and then you didn't get Monza, right? Or we didn't get which one did we not have? It was the, oh, uh, Imola. Imola. We didn't have the Imola race. And so you're kind of, everybody's kind of going, well, we didn't really see anything there. And then you end up going and monaco doesn't tell you much and so we were mm-hmm. waiting to say oh they got some upgrades in monaco no one cares because no one knows exactly what that's going to mean on that type of a circuit but barcelona showed you something and that is mercedes with a two three finish and it was it was a shock i think even to them but i think it also gives hope for the f1 fan who is hoping that it wasn't just going to be a runaway sweep on the season for red bull yeah i think that um even though Max still won by 20 seconds, I mean, we're used to seeing him beat Sergio by 20 seconds. And right. then the next closest, you know, Aston Martin is like, you know, minute. 50 seconds behind yeah. Max. So even though it felt like, a, you know, it, it was a dominant win, I mean, that's like three tenths of a second per lap or something that he was faster on average than Mercedes, which is a closer gap than I think what we've seen uh, so far this season. So I think it tells us that Mercedes is on the right path. Like they're directionally now. Uh, on the right development path, and they're they've closed the gap to the rest of the field, and I think it's a it's a very competitive midfield with you know just Max Verstappen as an as an outlier, <laughs> right? And for some reason in the multiverse where Max Verstappen isn't a Formula One driver, we have like a super competitive season right now uh, for you know everybody else. Uh, but you know Max has just had one of the most dominant weekends in the history of F one. He 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 just swept the board. He 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 hit for the cycle. He had. Uh, he's P1, uh, you know, he won pole, he led every lap, he had the fastest lap, uh, even which when his, was kind of a weird, which his attempt, engineer right? didn't want him to get, right? Um, you know, and he led every practice, or I think he led every practice, he, he just like cleaned house, it was crazy. Well, watching that and then seeing the way that I don't know, I think I heard Christian Horner mention something about this when it comes to Sergio. Because that poor dude, he's in the sec- he's in second place in the in the in the uh, drivers' championship, but he's only eighteen points ahead of uh, of Fernando, and he's only thirty points ahead of Lewis Hamilton and George Russell, or Lewis Hamilton at least in that in the drivers' standing. And Lewis Hamilton, and George Russell having the best weekend that they've had as a team in a long time. I look and, and go. Uh, Christian Horner mentioned, no, this is probably good for Sergio because he can maybe just freaking relax and race because what he's been doing is he's been told you might be in the in the race for this world championship which i think was probably never actually the case Mm -hmm. and then he started to make mistakes not not sergio type mistakes it seemed like either Uh, mistakes from a guy who was probably overdoing it right Mm -hmm. and just kind of worrying out of control a little bit and just racing like garbage over the last few weeks and having you know I mean, it's just so hard to put yourself in those spots in qualifying and even in that car to put yourself up and and to be even fighting for anything. I mean, in his case, he has not been uh, on the podium. And 
it's because of how bad his qualifying is. And I think he's trying so freaking hard in qualifying. He's just not putting it there. I mean, he better figure it out because there are drivers on this grid who will be breathing down the neck for that seat. And Max Verstappen's like, I don't really care who you put there, but if you don't perform at that number two spot for, it's not good enough to be in second place for Christian Horner and Helmut Marco. Certainly uh, you can't be, it's not good enough to be in second place. You need to be like actually pretty dang close. It's the same freaking car as Max Verstappen. And he is, uh, he's not done well with it the last few races. Yeah. He's underperforming for sure. And if he continues like this and you get Mercedes on a streak of twos and second and third place finishes, I mean, they could close the gap to Red Bull. I mean, there's still a lot of season left. I mean, if Max wins every single race, they won't catch him. But, you know, if Max has a DNF here and there and then Mercedes captures a win, like two two drivers versus one uh, would make things interesting. And it would be an, a total failure if Red Bull didn't win the Constructors' Championship with Max being so dominant. So, yeah, the, the heat is on Sergio for sure. Who's the worst second driver? Uh, I'm not saying overall. I'm saying of these. <laughs> who's the worst second driver? Uh, Sergio Perez or uh, Lance Stroll? Uh, Lance had a good race this last week. He did. They went six and seven, right? And which is weird, too, because Fernando's like, tell, tell what was his radio message? He was like, uh, tell him I won't pass tell him. Tell Lance like Stroll that. to be, he's okay. I will not pass him. And he's like, thank you so much for, uh, I appreciate that. And he was like, and after the race, he does this magnet. Again, every, every post race interview with Fernando is like a guy we've never seen before. Mm-hmm. He's like, you know, either way, six seven for the team. If it's me, if it's Lance, uh, whatever. You know, like, come on, dude. It's not the guy. I think he'll be cutthroat when it needs to be. But I mean, it was the first non podium for uh, Fernando in quite some time. So, uh, I don't know if Mercedes has run down Aston Martin totally, but it is a for the Mercedes fans out there. They should be pretty dang excited. And on the flip side, you've got Ferrari. Uh, who I don't know what they should be thinking right now. Oh, I don't know. What, I don't know what to expect. You have one of the best drivers in the world, and yet he's 16 points behind his teammate, who is just kind of bar- Carlos Sainz is not having like fantastic races. He's just kind of barely keeping it together, but he's certainly outperforming uh, old Chuck Leclerc on the racetrack. It seems weird. Yeah, Charles is he's a lot like Sergio. He's like in his own head. I think, and it, you see it on Saturday in qualifying. And you know, they said that he had some sort of an issue that he was his left turns were a lot slower than his right turns. And so there's something going on in the car, but then in the race, he didn't like speed up through the field, you know, right. and he didn't have an awesome race. And they went, took the car back to Marinello and tore it down. And the result was there was nothing wrong with Uh-oh. the car, you know? So he's uh, uh, in his head. I think that in the same way that Sergio is that like, they just shooting themselves in the foot on Saturday. Uh, okay. Let's talk about some of the other finishes here. Uh, some of the surprise guys so far this year. I just I look at Nico Hulkenberg, who has six points for Haas, which doesn't sound like much, but for Haas, it's amazing. You know, and especially with uh, Kevin Magnussen kind of underperforming compared to his teammate. Nico Hulkenberg should be considered for the comeback driver of the year. I don't even know if they do that award, but if they did it, <laughs> F one most improved. Yeah. Get on there because yes, I mean he's been a guy who hasn't been on the grid for a while, and with a lesser car. I mean, when he's in Q three. This last this last go, I was like, dude, this guy finds ways to find time on the track, and you know, Gunther Steiner just looks a little bit more like a genius, you know, week over week, and they have no business, you know, splitting the the McLarens on on uh, <laughs> you know on in the driver standings like they're doing with uh with uh with Nico, but man, it's just crazy. I just have loved the American team having a little bit of success this year. And despite the fact that their that their works team, the Ferrari team, has been struggling, the pace that uh, that Haas has been showing is pretty good. So the things are on the up and up for the American team. Yeah, they've kind of flown under the radar. We haven't really talked about them very much, but uh, I think they're overperforming. And it might be the fact that like with the MoneyGram sponsorship, uh, they're finally spending to the cost cap, and so we could see that all that uh, R and D is starting to play out a bit. But you'd think that Magnussen would also be performing as well. It is weird that he's not racing as well. It's. Uh, what's interesting is that both of those guys are on a contract year right now. And so uh, I wouldn't put it past, uh, you know, Gunther to recycle both of them if, if he found sure. the two right drivers, right? But I think Holkenberg is making a case for himself to stay on the team, and maybe Ma- it's time for Magnuson to get replaced. Uh, driver standings, of course, Max is running away with this thing. Uh, I would think that everybody just assumes he'd be the, your uh, your presumed world champion, even if – even if uh, even if Mercedes does figure some things out, I mean, they're 90 points behind, you know, I mean, that's, that's a tough thing to, to come back from. So now 
in the rear view is is Barcelona, and now this week, after a week off, they head to Canada, which I think in our uh, little Twitter group that we've been talking about is how cheap some of the tickets have been for uh, yeah. Montreal. I mean, my heavens, that's the race we should have gone to, Dan. We had to go to Canada, man. And look, we're not going to be really able to is. afford Vegas. Oh, no. We're on the same continent. We missed a freaking opportunity here. You and I should be in Montreal this weekend, and yet here we are it's back in Salt Lake City. Not too late. It's Wednesday. <laughs> not too late. Just go tomorrow. He checks his watch. He's like, <laughs> I got Scott's fly deals going on right now. Uh, but I don't know what Canada sets up like. Is it more like a street circuit, or is it more like a Barcelona, just like straightforward race? It's a it's an F1 uh, track. What are we going to see this weekend in terms of who's got some setups that may still kind of hold like they did from uh, from Barcelona? Yeah, so Montreal, the circuit, uh, Gilles Villeneuve, um, a, named after Canadian F1 champ. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an interesting track. It's a purpose-built uh, racing track. You know, it's not a street uh, mm-hmm. course that they're converting to a racetrack so purpose built but it's acts i think a lot like a street course because it's got some long straights and then some tight corners there's not like big sweeping high downforce corners like we saw at barcelona so i would compare it like it's more kind of like a a mix between baku and monza a little bit so i think high high speed is going to be important it's got um a couple really long straights and then you know some tight hairpins so um i think you could probably look we haven't gone to Monza yet but you could look back at Baku and you know Red Bull's very slippery and at the high speed it does a great job with the balance of low drag and high downforce and so uh I think that they um will you know still the favorites to win but Mercedes historically has been very dominant at So last year they Canada. had a good, they had a good Spain GP and then everybody's like yeah we'll see though and then they came back at Canada and they had another and they and they performed well there uh and so I don't I mean, I would just imagine with a guy like Lewis Hamilton who just does not – I mean, he's, he's brutal. He's just, you know, relentless in terms of trying to run down uh, perfection, and he's and he's expecting it from his team and everything. Uh, you could see a really, really good weekend. This is what I like is that at least Aston Martin and Mercedes and to some extent Ferrari and even like Alpine creeping up. Mm-hmm. Like Alpine yeah. has had some good freaking races late, uh, lately. And the French team has – has all sorts of reason to think we could we could run down Ferrari at least a little bit. We could be uh, right on their heels if we if we put, if we string some good races together. And if Ferrari keeps making stupid mistakes, they have to imagine, man, we're in a good spot if we're able to kind of run those dudes down. Oh yeah, what a story would that be if Alpine outran Ferrari this year? <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> the French and Italians hating each other <laughs> yeah. forever. Yeah. Oh man. Well, one thing about Canada too is that it's got an interesting DRS setup. So. There's a, a double DRS zone. So um, the coming into the third sector, there's a really tight hairpin followed by a really long straight and then a chicane that goes to the um, past the start finish line. Mm-hmm. And the detection point is before the hairpin. And then if you're within one second right before that slow hairpin, you can do both those DRS. You get zones. DRS down the long stretch and then it goes into a, a chicane. And then there's another DRS down the front stretch to turn one. So it, the DRS is probably going to play a big factor and it kind of did in spain too because with that taking out that last sector chicane there was a lot of passing going into turn one because the the cars were just able to stay close through the last sector and then um catch up through the drs down the front stretch and so i think that's what really i mean most all the passing happened in that drs zone and so is this a passing is this a passing track is this one there that you yeah. tend to get a little bit more uh, of of some space to be able to, and it, with a double DRS, you know, mm-hmm. situation that could be there could be a lot of excitement. And some guys passing some people up there, yeah. And and you know, Canada is a lot like Miami. I think we're, Miami we're not really used to yet because we only had two tracks there. And Miami we had like sixty overtakes or something. I think it was the most of the year. Um, and so I think that Canada could be a same situation. And you're looking it up now, but I think the other factor is. Uh, rain in the forecast and it is it is it's supposed to be look my thing is is like dump in quality dump during the race qual even even qualifying would be good where you just it where it becomes a mess in qualifying and then you get a weird grid Mm -hmm. and then kind of all bets are off and somebody could make a run and usually things even out but uh right now 90 percent chance of rain on saturday 
And, I like keep my fingers crossed. Yeah. And then Sunday, sixty percent chance. Now we're a couple of days out still, but uh, and that can change obviously. But and this is it, a rainy. This is a rainy track historically. This yeah, I think it problem. rained in qualifying last year, and I think that's when Alonso and the Alpine put it like I think on the front row, or I think he was second place. And so he was. He surprised everybody in that Alpine. Uh, so it could be the you know similar situation where we get some of these rain uh, savants uh, that could get themselves up further high up that you know max he's good but i think when the rain comes it becomes a lot more uh, uh level playing field where are we at here are we seven races in to the season is it too early to tell to start firing guys off of the grid to start talking <laughs> about the seats that kind of uh, start rotating no around? oh no silly season i think is it's never is too early to start taking momentum here uh I mean, it's pretty hard not to look at the rookies and go, boy, you guys have been sort of disappointing, Oof, including yeah. our uh, American friend Logan Sargent. Yeah, Logie Bear. Yeah. Is that a little bit like, I mean, is Williams the type of team that goes, hold on, we'll give you a couple of years here? Because there are people who go, you cannot just do one year and then just go, no, he's not good enough. Um, you know, his equipment's not it's not spectacular. Uh, I mean, it's not like Alex Albon has been, you know, tearing up every race either. So, uh, what are the chances of him sticking around, uh, Oscar Piastri sticking around? What's going to happen with that seat at Alpha Tauri with, uh, with Yuki? Uh, is there anybody in danger of losing their seat this year that are like, man, for real, Daniel Ricardo's breathing down your neck here, and he's trying to find a way back in? Uh, I think DeVries has the most to worry about, just being that Alpha Tauri so, and Red Bull's just so cutthroat, mm-hmm. right? And uh, and I think there's a, a pretty big performance difference going on between those Nick Nick and Yuki. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Logan Williams is probably going to show more patience. Uh, and I mean, how long did they stick with Latifi? Right? How many seasons does that guy? <laughs> well, help to have the money behind. Yeah, him, right? and and I mean, that might come into fact you know, play. You know, that might be a factor if the Sargent family wants to help keep him in there another year. Yeah, we talked about the 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 billionaire uncle. Come on, the, they got the money. So um, I I don't think Piastri should be worried. I mean, he's 13th in the standings and Lando's 11th so he's not I think showing um yeah. a big performance gap to Lando points, yeah. and uh he's uh, I think um on the same level as like a Lando Charles just like hot, you know young talent with a lot of potential so I think that'd be dumb to lose them after everything they went through to get him so uh man the other thing about Williams is uh one thing we learned this week was uh cuz Logan beached it in qualifying or practice right. or something they had to lift him up and so we got the undercar shot of the Williams <laughs> no one cared no one cared and it was <laughs> insane it was like a complete flat, flat plane yeah it was like compared to what we saw on Mercedes and Red Bull which was it, you just can't believe it. Like, how is Williams even on the racetrack with that <laughs> it's the the difference is in, is incredible it was you know completely flat like you and I could have fabricated this yeah. thing out of plastic uh, and, you know, compared to Red Bull, which was, uh, you know, they probably spent their entire cost cap on the development <laughs> on, of that floor. On just the, like, give Adrian Newey whatever money he wants for Aero yeah. stuff. So that was pretty funny that they lifted up, they looked underneath, and everyone went, hmm, and then just ignored it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> interesting, interesting. That's not the vibe that's, we're going to do. That's sad. <laughs> speaking of concepts, speaking of Aero concepts, Mercedes has totally said, look, the zero pod or whatever they called it's it. on, yeah. It's got that concept was like it's not like they do the thing where I mean a lot of times they try to be patient and be like tr- Toto's like we're trying something new and we are, we are working on it back at the factory it's a factory and in the end like they bagged it and it immediately saw results yeah I saw the best meme or the joke it was like how great would it be if Red Bull showed up next week with zero side pods just to screw <laughs> with Mercedes just to mess with them and they get it right you know yeah. they, Adrian News like no it's a concept we haven't tried it yet but pff, we're thinking about it <laughs> and they do it and then everybody has and then it, because over the last the amount of side pod reworkings that we've seen yeah in the field and then part of it is just cuz the new uh you know the new regulations from uh, 2 years ago and so you just go Okay, obviously everybody's still trying to figure it out, but the side pod stuff, everyone's like, okay, we overthought it. Yeah. Fine. Everyone like, just regress to the mean yeah. or regress to, okay, Red Bull's got to figure Fine. it out. Just make it look like just that. Just make it look like that and uh, and don't make your under, don't make your uh, your floor look like Williams. And I think you'll probably be in a better spot. Uh, okay. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some of the, I, I wanted to bring up something from a, a media standpoint. I know you have something as well. I was reading this week about the Drive to Survive Season 5, and it's got a 40% increase on viewership. Really? Um, in the first – that first week, they, Netflix is notorious for not giving numbers out, right? Hmm. 
But they ended up in the first seven days having a 40% increase from season four hmm. uh, year over year. And it's like 200% from the from the first uh, two seasons. And Netflix has been playing around with the idea of live sports that they've been doing. And apparently hmm. they actually tried to bid oh. to get some streaming rights for, for F1. F1 and they lost to ESPN. Hmm. And which I thought was fine. I mean, but I mean, F1 in a way has a lot to thank. Uh, Netflix for, and Netflix says we're going to try to get into the, the live sports game, which everybody is on any any of these streaming right. platforms. They're, they're trying to do it. Um, but I know that ESPN is trying something new for their American audiences or anybody who wants to participate, and that is bringing some commentary from a couple of guys. One, Daniel Ricardo, who a lot of Americans love. He's like a, he's like an honorary American. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and Will Arnett, who's a massive uh, F1 fan and – you know, it's probably the most recognizable voice, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, on yeah. every cartoon you could ever imagine. Uh, and, of course, my favorite role, Job, from uh, from Arrested Development. So, uh, Will Arnett, Daniel Ricardo, they're going to be on ESPN. Is this like a like a Manning cast type thing that they so do? It's with the actually being produced by the Manning awesome. company, right? So, they're basically taking that model from the, the Monday Night Football Manning stuff and just replicating it for F1. And I think it makes sense because when you turn on F1 on ESPN, you're getting the Sky Sports broadcast, right? So you're hearing all the foreign accents. And I think if you're a brand new uh, American fan, you're probably like try- playing a lot of catch up, trying to figure out what's going on. If you watch it on F1 TV, you have like a variety of picks you could make. You could listen to Crofty or you could listen to the F1 brand feed or you can listen to some of the other foreign ones. And uh, – I think that people would love to click on somebody and see a face like Will Arnett oh, it's and hear his be voice, great. man. The um, so Will Arnett has podcast the Smartless podcast with the with Bateman and um, Sean Mich- Hayes. Uh, I thought Michelle Beadle maybe did something with it too. Oh, she might have. Yeah. Oh no, but I mean, like we're, the F one podcast that they do, oh, Michelle Beadle is okay. part of that. So anything that they've done F one wise, I think she's yeah. done it. Yeah. So the Smartless one, they had Daniel Ricardo on there, mm. and uh, it was a great episode. Like you know. Daniel's just like, uh, like you said, an amazing, uh, fun personality. And Will Arnett, like, he's kind of more of a recent fan, but he knows his stuff. And so I think he's going to, I think those two are going to be a great duo. And, it, you know, I plan on watching it this weekend to um, see. So they're what kicking it's it like. off for Canada. Yeah. So I think they have plans to do it for Canada, the USGP, and uh, Vegas. So the two remaining American races and the Canadian race. So, and I, I think that's probably too related to the fact that that's in like, kind of more of a prime time not really sure. prime time but yeah, yeah. more of a daytime slot uh for american viewers and so I, I think that makes sense it's gonna be a ton of fun i'm glad that they're doing it and well one other thing i just remembered on the netflix side is i saw something this week about netflix is trying to put together like a golf tournament with the f1 drivers this and is, the full this swing is the, guys this is the uh this is the part of them trying to push themselves into the live sports programming i think they tried something else they they have tried one at least one other thing, but I think that uh, this golf tournament, which we know a bunch of the guys on the grid play a ton of golf, yeah. and uh, but I think it's to be able to have because the same producers that do Full Swing on on mm-hmm. uh, that docu series on Netflix, the same uh, Drive to Survive guys, so you can be able to see some of these dudes who you've been watching race and be kind of in that normal sphere mm-hmm. and to see it live that might be a really really cool, cool thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, numbers wise. I don't know. I mean, when they talk about how big the explosion of uh, of of this is, how this has been on TV in America, I'm not sure what I'm not sure if it is ratings wise getting more viewership. I haven't heard much about what ESPN is getting on a weekly basis on these during these races or, or what we've seen in terms of an increase of watching. I remember that there was a stat last year for the USGP in Austin that you know some combined stat of viewership over the weekend was comparable to like an NFL playoff game. Um, I would have to go up and find the numbers, but I think that that was kind of the that biggest week like a lot uh, for, for ESPN. Yeah. Given it was the USGP. So um, yeah, we should pull up the numbers, maybe do a whole episode on that. See how the, see how the American viewership is holding up the health of F1. Could you imagine that's what we're talking about in 2023? The health of F1 in America, <laughs> three races. And if, and if Liberty media could get their, could get their way, there'd be 10 races here oh, man. Uh, in the U S I mean, yeah. my heavens. Uh, okay. Who's going to suck this weekend? Oh. What's your dream podium? <laughs> Let's go. I mean, just put it out there on the line. You just have to make some predictions here. We're a, few, we're a couple days out from the actual race. So what do you have, Dan Jimenez? Dream podium, so I'm not going to say Max. Um, <laughs> for not saying the I most know. probable podium. Sure. Uh, I'm going to say it rains and Fernando wins. Oh, man. 
Yeah. Race 33. The race kings are going to come to the tops. I know he kind of said it with like his tongue placed firmly in his cheek. But he said, we will crush them. <laughs> like, after the weekend, did you see that? He goes, we no. will crush them. Because they were like, hey, what's up? You didn't make the podium this week. And he goes, yeah, that will not happen again. And then he goes, and then like, okay, well, so what's going to happen in Canada? We will crush them. And That's then he great. walked off. He got a smirk on his face. Like, come on. He, was, so he hasn't funny. been crushing anybody, you know, this year. But that's why it was kind of funny. But it was... I think everything this year for Aston Martin is just gravy, yeah. man. I mean, yeah. just anything it's, they do. It's a bit of a home race, too, for the Stroll family, you know. So maybe they carry some of that momentum, the home home mojo. So why not a Fernando 1, Lance, Lance, two. Lance, three. Lance 3. I'm not going to say 2. And then, like, uh, like yeah, a, Max. Like now, if Max, is, if Max isn't on the podium, I mean, if he's yeah. not 1, he's not on the podium. Right. Yeah. Something so happened. So maybe a Sergio situation or, like, a George Russell. Yeah. Yeah. There it is. Mercedes, George. George is good in the wet. He won that wet race in, in Brazil, so very possible. Okay. We've decided it then. That will be the fate uh, this weekend. Mercedes will be second place with George Russell. You're going to get a first and third from the Aston Martin team. There you go. Love it. And Fernando getting uh, win number 33 for his career. That's what he's going to be so excited about. And I am too, frankly. I mean, it, it, it's so funny that a guy who's been such a huge villain, everybody's a big fan of right now. Like, it, it, I don't know why it suddenly it's becomes... It's like a new generation, yeah. Like, people who didn't experience Fernando in the early years, it's like clean slate. I mean, think about... And I, I think I've recommended this podcast to you, The Sports Strangest Crimes. And they talk about that 2008 season when it was Lewis's rookie year. And Fernando, and them finding out about the the back and forth, the copying of the oh, Ferrari yeah. mm-hmm. uh, playbook, you know, their, their whole car. Spike that it. is That is a really good podcast to listen to. But those guys freaking hated each other. Fernando Alonso was a giant jerk. It's mm-hmm. amazing. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. All right. Dan, race week, man. Let's we'll talk it. to you after this uh, after uh, this weekend in Canada, and we'll break it all down for Dan Jimenez and Alex Keery. We'll talk to you next time, everybody.